Hi, welcome to video three for topic two of year 11 chemistry. In the last video, um, we just started having a look at how you draw the shapes of molecules and I finished on this slide and said to have a go, go away and have a look at how you can do them. So for today, I'm just gonna simply put up quickly the answers to these ones and um, you can compare about how you went versus these ones. If you didn't do the last video, that's okay. Um, you can just see these um, seven molecules here. I'm just gonna quickly go through and draw the structure and name the shapes as well. Okay, so the first one we had was CF4. So there's four atoms, each of them arranged tetrahedrally around the central carbon atom like that. Okay, so that is a tetrahedral arrangement around carbon tetrafluoride. Okay, so you go through, you do your electron dot diagrams, okay, and um, you then um, put your atoms equally spaced around and you join up your lone electron that was all covered in the last video. So water, most people know water, that sort of Mickey Mouse shape as well, that's what we call V-shape or vent. Okay, so it's a V-shape molecule, sorry for my writing. The next one was ammonia. Now ammonia, when you do up your um, electron dot diagram, has a lone pair of electrons up the top here. And so your hydrogens come down the bottom like this, because this lone pair of electrons here counts as a bonding region that repels the um, bonded electrons downwards, and you get this trigonal pyramid shape or your ammonia. So that one's trigonal pyramid. The next one we had was carbon monoxide. So carbon monoxide is like this, carbon with a double bond oxygen. That's linear. Okay, again, sorry for my writing. The next one we had was hydrogen cyanide. So there's actually a hydrogen attached to a carbon and then a triple bond to a nitrogen here. All of these need to have um, full outer shells. So hydrogen needs two electrons, the carbon needs eight, the nitrogen needs eight there. And so again, that's a linear arrangement around that one. And then we went into a couple of the harder ones. So the first one was sulfuric acid. So sulfuric acid has double bonded oxygens above and below. And then you've got single bonded oxygens on each side and it's one of the acids. So the hydrogens are actually bonded to the oxygens. Now there's a vent or um, V-shape around each of the oxygens, but when we've got a structure like this, we refer to the central carbon atom, and for the central carbon atom, there's four oxygens around it, so that is a tetrahedral arrangement around the central carbon atom. The last one is carbonic acid, so it's a carbon with a double bond oxygen, and then we've got the oxygens coming out either side here, again with the hydrogens on it. Again, we look at the central arrangement around the carbon, and that is trigonal planar for this one. Okay, so that's each of the seven structures. Okay, it goes through and does actually cover um, the, the five different shapes you can know of tetrahedral linear, trigonal pyramid, tetrahedral, and trigonal planar. Okay, so um, if you need a little bit more practice than that, I do suggest that um, you look at my YouTube video on drawing molecular structures. That's a really useful help for you. Now, when we get to polyatomic ions, Okay, polyatomic ions. Um, so the word poly means many, so it's many atoms, so, and then it's got a charge on it. So it's an, um, something that's charged that's made up of many atoms. So we looked at sulfuric acid and carbonic acid just before. Um, when we're looking at just the iron, so the charge part of it, okay, you'll end up with unbonded electrons. Okay, so what that means is if you actually did up this one properly, firstly, you'd have carbon with one, two, three, four electrons around it, like that. Okay. And then you have your three oxygens, which you put at equal distances around it. And each oxygen has six electrons on it. So I'm just drawing them up here. Two, three, four, five, six. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. And then we start bonding them up. So uh, this one bonds up, uh, that one can bond up, and then these ones can bond up here. Okay. And so we've found what we've got here, and I'm just going to try and get a different color for the pen. Uh, just to, so I can highlight it here. We've got a lone electron here and a lone electron here, okay? Each electron has a negative charge, which is why when there's two of them, we end up with a two negative charge on the polyatomic ion down here. So we just draw it up like we would normally, okay? But because it's charged, we put square brackets around it, and that shows that it's a ion, okay? So, um, not too much different from drawing your normal structures, okay? Again, follow your valence shell electron pair repulsion model. So um, draw up your electron dots, put your atoms around it, and if you have a lone electron, that's gonna give it a negative charge. 
So I suggest you try doing these ones. The sulfate one is SO4 two minus, all right, the phosphate one is PO4 three minus, and then we've done the carbonate. So hopefully for the sulfate, you'll work out that you need um, two oxygens with a lone electron each. For the phosphate, you need three oxygens with a lone electron each, and that's what gives you your charge. The main thing to remember is that you put your square brackets around it. So I've got those ones there. As I said, draw those up. Um, what I might do now is I'll, if you, I encourage you just to pause it, Okay. If you pause it, um, then you'll be able to then follow through, uh, maybe give it a chance yourself, and then I'll go through and do it. So sulfur in the middle like this. Okay. So it has six electrons on it. Like there, you put your oxygens around it. They've all got six electrons each as well. One, two, three, four, five, six. I'm just going to try and do this really quickly, sorry. Um, so each of those electrons around it like that. Start bonding it up. So bonding, bonding. Bonding, all right, it was SO3, two minus we were looking for. So we're looking for two lone electrons here. So we're going to leave two electrons down the bottom. We're going to bond this one up as well. Now, you'll see, if I go to a different colour again, um, you'll see that the sulphur has a lone pair of electrons here. That counts as a bonding region, so that's going to repel the other electrons downwards. So the actual shape we're going to end up with is this. So an oxygen down to the bottom, two oxygens on either side. That lone pair of electrons up the top there makes up um, the fourth region, which is why it's in a tetrahedral shape here initially. But the actual arrangement is trigonal pyramid because there's no atom up the top. Because we've got two electrons, all right, so a free, which was this one here and this one here. That's why we've got a two minus charge. So that's the um, sulfate ion, SO3, two minus. Sorry, did I do... Yeah, I did do SO3, 2 minus, not SO4, sorry. And then we've got PO4, 3 minus. So I'll just go back to blue again. So I'm just going to draw this up. PO4 is double bonded oxygen there. And then there's three oxygens like this with your square brackets around it and a 3 minus. So you can practice doing that one, doing your electron pair repulsion model as well. Now, what we're going to move on to is what um, we call covalent bond, coordinate covalent bonding. Now, coordinate covalent bonding is when you can't have an atom that can expand its octet. So when we were going through and looking at the drawing the shapes of um, some of the molecules, we talked about something, anything in period three can have up to 18 electrons in its outer shell. That's called expanded octet. So that's why sulfur um, could go up to 12 or 16 or 18 electrons in the outer shell if it really needed to. But what happens if you're trying to do a bond with something that's in period two and you can only have eight electrons in the outer shell? Well, normally we know that a, a, a covalent bond forms by the overlap of electron shells. So where one atom brings an electron in and the other atom brings an electron in as well. But if you do that for some of them, you might actually get too many electrons in the outer shell. So what we do, is we actually have one atom donating both or sharing both electrons to create the bond. So ozone is a really good example here. All right, this is um, oxygen as you would have normally. So um, here we've got six electrons around each oxygen, okay, and then they um, share up so that they can actually um, create full outer shells for their oxygen. But what that means is if we try to bring another oxygen in here, okay, what that's going to mean is that we don't have. Um, enough electrons to be able to donate over, okay? So if we tried to bring these extra electrons over here and we shared up to make more double bonds, this oxygen here would end up with 10 electrons, right, rather than eight. And that's not okay because it can't expand its octet, only has two electron shells. So what that means is that this oxygen here is going to donate both electrons over here to create a bond. So there's a single bond between this oxygen and this oxygen. And so when you're drawing up your structure for ozone, it looks like this. So oxygen, double bond oxygen, and then a single oxygen over here, okay? And so it's got a V shape or a bent shape. Sometimes in some of the older textbooks or maybe in some of the stuff that I've done before, um, we used to do coordinate covalent bonds with a little arrow in, on them. So whether you see it with oxygen like that or if you see it with the arrow, okay? Uh, it doesn't have to have an arrow anymore for a coordinate covalent bond, okay? If you do see that, that does mean coordinate covalent bond, one, one atom, both electrons. Okay. The best one for you to practice on um, would be to do nitric acid, so HNO3. 
because nitrogen is in um, period two, that can only have a maximum of eight electrons. So I encourage you to try and do that one because uh, you're going to need a coordinate covalent bond there. All right. So here it is here. Um, can you draw it using coordinate covalent bond? I'm going to get you to just, again, just pause it, have a little practice, and then I'm going to show you how we do it. All right, central atom is going to be nitrogen. There are five electrons around the nitrogen here. All right, we've got three oxygens, so we're going to equally spread them around. They've all got six electrons because they're in group six. Okay, and it's an acid. The hydrogen here means that hydrogen is going to be attached to an oxygen. So I'm just going to put the hydrogen over here with its electron. That's going to form a bond there. Okay, now we want to bond each of the um, oxygens to the nitrogen. Okay, so if you do it this way, if you go um, one there, one there, and one there, that might be the way you want to do it first time. And you'll notice now that the nitrogen has, um, needs to be some cursor again, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons around it. So the nitrogen is happy, that's going to fall out of shell. But this oxygen and this oxygen only have seven electrons. They each have a single electron here. So if we did it this way, this would be HNO3 2 minus, and that's not what we've got here. Okay. So what we need to do is we need to actually erase these ones all right, and work out a way that we can get each of the oxygens to have a full outer shell as well as the nitrogen. And so this one's a little bit trickier, but what actually happens is we do this, okay, and we do this. So this, this oxygen here has eight electrons, that's happy. This oxygen here has eight electrons, that's happy. But the nitrogen here, if you now have a look, has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons already. The nitrogen already has eight electrons. It doesn't want any more. This oxygen up here only has six electrons at the moment, so that's unhappy. That still needs two more. So what we do is we take these two electrons here, the lone pair here, and that forms a coordinate covalent bond to the oxygen up the top. That doesn't increase the number of um, electrons the nitrogen has, okay, but it does allow this oxygen up here to now become eight electrons and be really happy. Okay, so the structure of this is a nitrogen with double bond oxygen, single bond oxygen to hydrogen, and then a coordinate covalent bond to that oxygen there. Again, you don't have to show with the arrow. That's just <clears throat> how I was taught, and it's been something that was around for quite a while, and they've just recently removed it. So coordinate covalent bonds might take a little bit more practice, um, and it's about understanding that anything that is in period two cannot expand its octet and cannot have any more than eight electrons around it. So if we're looking at covalent molecules and their properties, uh, since they're all very small molecules, they are, there are not a lot of bonds to break. Okay, the Covalent bonds are strong bonds between atoms, but there's not strong bonds between the molecules, and that's what determines your boiling point, your melting point. <clears throat> so you don't need a lot of energy to separate them, which means they're generally gases or liquids at room temperature. Okay? As they do get bigger, all right, just as you increase molecular weight, you increase um, the amount of energy required to break molecules apart, so they do become solid. So that's why things like sugar, even though um, it is a covalent molecule, it does have a higher melting point. There are no free electrons. Um, all covalent molecules, um, so covalent molecules do not conduct electricity in the solid state. Okay, when they dissolve in solution, they do not form ions. Okay, so there's, um, they don't conduct electricity in the aqueous state. And when melted, they do not form ions or release electrons. So they don't conduct electricity in the molten state. Okay, so. Just remember this table, they're not a solid at room temperature generally because they um, exist by themselves as molecules that don't conduct electricity in the molten or solid state or aqueous form, and they don't have high melting points. There are a couple of exceptions, and those are what we call covalent lattices. So in the um, first video, we looked at ionic lattices, and we looked at um, how they form big three-dimensional structures. Um, silicon and carbon in group four, they're non-metals, okay? but they can form four covalent bonds. So they've got the slight advantage of being able to actually um, form larger substances. There's a few different forms of carbon. We call those allotropes. So graphite and diamond are the two main forms. And silicon, again, has quite a few different forms as well. There's pure silicon, and then we've got the silicates where it's combined with oxygen. Okay, so I'll just show you some of those. 
Here's graphite. We've got six membered ring structures, okay, um, which, which are lined up in sheets. Okay, so those sheets um, have free electrons between them, so that allows it to conduct electricity. Diamond, on the other, has a tetrahedral arrangement around each carbon atom, okay, and so there's no free electrons, so that doesn't conduct electricity. Silicon dioxide has a tetrahedral arrangement, and pure silica has a tetrahedral arrangement, so they're all very similar. They all have very high melting points, but they don't conduct electricity. Okay. So, um, as you'd expect, because they're three-dimensional lattices, right, they have very high melting points, which means they're solid, but with the exception of graphite, they don't conduct electricity in a solid, molten, or aqueous state, just like other covalent substances. The only reason graphite does, as I said, is between the sheets here, there's actually what we call delocalized electrons, a little bit like we'll find out in metallic bonds a little bit later. All right, so this one's been a little bit longer, sorry, um, but um, we've covered a lot in here. Um, probably the main ones to take out of this is you need to understand the properties of covalent molecules um, and the reason why they are low melting point and boiling point um, gases and liquids at room temperature that don't conduct electricity in the solid, molten or aqueous form. Uh, you need to have an understanding about co continuous covalent structures, okay? And then you also need to be able to draw um, the structures uh, for um, polyatomic ions. And so that might be what you need to spend a little bit more time on for this one. As always, though, if you've got any questions, just thanks, guys. This is